Today on Under the Big Tree, 11 reasons why I switched from Pro Tools to Reaper. I started using Pro Tools with version 3 around 20 years ago. And for the past two decades, it had been my DAW of choice, both for post-production and for music recording. But starting a few years back, I began to play around with Reaper. And the more I used it, the more I used it. Today, I use Reaper for all of my sound design, dialogue, music recording, and mixing needs. The only time I open Pro Tools is when I need to output audio from another studio that uses Pro Tools. This is not meant to be a Pro Tools bashing video or to say that Pro Tools is bad at all. It is an indispensable tool for much of the audio production community. If the DAW you use does everything you need it to, then it is the perfect DAW for you. Whether it's Pro Tools, Ableton Live, Cubase, Logic, Nuendo, Reaper, or anything else. The purpose of this video is to carefully examine the many reasons why I made the decision to switch to Reaper after two decades with the world's most ubiquitous post-production tool, and what my experience has been since then. So for this video, I will not focus on the negative aspects of Pro Tools, but simply on the positive aspects of Reaper that made me make the jump. Let's start with how I ended up working with Reaper in the first place. I had been using Pro Tools for both music and post-production since the late 90s. I had always used the HD versions, which included expensive hardware purchases to ensure that I had the most powerful and compatible system available at the time. Over the course of my time using Pro Tools, I had invested over $25,000 in hardware and software. I knew how to use it like the back of my hand, and had even written articles on Pro Tools software and techniques for Electronic Musician magazine. In 2014, I took my son to a Boy Scout camp for a weekend-long seminar on how to make your own movies. When we got there, I realized that there were a couple of great teachers to work with the boys on writing the script, shooting, and editing. But there was no capability to do any audio post on the movies. So, I made the drive back home and ran into my studio with the intention of installing Pro Tools on my laptop, filling up a USB drive with sound effects and music, and heading back up to camp. I was unable to install Pro Tools on my laptop because it was running a later version of the operating system than my desktop Pro Tools rig, and the version of Pro Tools I owned was incompatible with it. I was low on time. As a last-ditch effort, I downloaded Reaper, which I had never used before except for in some MIDI programming for Guitar Hero type video games. Knowing I would have to learn how to use it on the fly, I grabbed my laptop and a hard drive of sounds and headed back. Over the course of the next couple of days, I learned Reaper, which wasn't that different than most other DAWs I had used, and then used it to do rudimentary music editing and sound design on eight or ten films made by Boy Scouts. By the end, I learned a very simple fact. Reaper can absolutely handle doing audio for post. Reaper is available for Mac, PC, and Linux. You can download the latest version of the software from the Reaper website at any time with no questions asked. As a sound designer, I usually have more than one audio application open at the same time. I've been using Amadeus Pro from Herrersoft for many years as my audio file editor of choice, and there are many standalone sound design apps, such as Galactic Assistant, that I use frequently to modify or create new sounds. When using Apple's Core Audio Driver, they all play nicely together. I can have Reaper, Amadeus Pro, Native Instruments Contact, and even Cubase all open at the same time. They all send their audio to the monitors as expected. Reaper's pricing couldn't be more reasonable. You can download a fully functioning version from the Reaper website and have 60 days to evaluate it. Once done, there is a two-tiered pricing model. If you make more than $20,000 a year using Reaper, then buy the commercial license for, wait for it, $225. Otherwise, buy the personal license for $65. There is only one version of Reaper. Whether you purchase the commercial, the personal, or even just continue to use it as an evaluation version, the choice is up to you and your conscience. 
the Reaper police will not come and track you down. Moreover, the license allows you free upgrades through the end of the next major point release. So right now, Reaper is at version 5.94, and buying a license today would entitle you to all updates until version 7. And if you don't choose to upgrade, your current version will continue to work just fine until the operating system changes finally render it obsolete. Copy protection is an accepted and important part of using commercial software. Pro Tools uses iLock USB hardware dongles to confirm that you are a legitimate user of their software. Reaper has no copy protection. When you purchase a license, you enter the serial number into the software and it is considered licensed. You can install it on a number of computers simultaneously, as I do. I can use it on my Mac Pro desktop machine, my laptop, and even my PC under the same license. After all, I'm only working with Reaper on one machine at a time. This flexibility is critically important in a world where I move from machine to machine depending upon where I am and what I'm doing at the time. Reaper is written with incredibly tight and lightweight code. It boots up very quickly, 4.3 seconds on my modest 2014 MacBook Air. And every event, every response to a keystroke, every window open is lightning quick. The download size of the entire package from Reaper's website is 16 megabytes. Not gigabytes, but megabytes. And when expanded and installed on my Macs, the app size is 64 megabytes. Reaper is so quick to open and close that I quit the program whenever I need to, then reopen it without giving it a second thought. When the pressure is on and you're working in your DAW all the time, that speed can be a lifesaver. Reaper's configurability is where it stands above any other digital audio workstation. There is a gargantuan list of commands called actions that you can assign hotkeys to. Hotkeys can be any combination of a regular key and as many special control keys like Shift, Command, and Option as you like. If you assign a keystroke to an action that has already been previously assigned to another action, it'll let you know, allowing you to either map it to the new action or find another keystroke for the new action instead. If you have a more complex workflow that requires more than one action, you can create macros just as easily as single actions. I remember having to use quick keys to try to automate tasks in other DAWs. In Reaper, it's all built in. Customizing Reaper doesn't just stop with keystrokes, though. You can change the look of the program just as easily. There are many user-generated themes for Reaper that are available online for free. There are themes to make it resemble Pro Tools or Cubase, and even ones to make it look like an old-fashioned console. But the ones that I really like are the themes that are easiest on the eyes and that are tailor-made to make Reaper as easy to use as possible. Note that if you want to completely reconfigure Reaper to look like Pro Tools and have the same keystrokes as Pro Tools, you can. But that misses the point. There are certainly some Pro Tools features that I love, and the ability to trim from the edit point to the beginning or end of the region, and those types of things I've created custom actions for in Reaper, and even assigned them the same keystrokes. But the primary goal is to use this software for what it is, and that includes memorizing the existing keystrokes and tailoring your workflow appropriately doesn't take that long, and in fact, plus and minus for zoom in and out in Reaper is more intuitive than the equivalent Pro Tools keystrokes of R and T. Overall, I have found most, not all, but most functions in Reaper more intuitive to me than their equivalents in Pro Tools. To me, the most important feature of any software tool I use is its stability. Pro Tools has been around for a long time and needs to be stable for the serious production facilities that use it all day long. I can't remember the last time that it straight up crashed on me, but there are annoying bugs around the edges of the software that stop my workflow in its tracks, displaying obtuse dialog boxes with DAE errors that you have to look up and try to figure out. Updates happen relatively frequently, and the Avid Manager lets you know when there are updates to various aspects of the software. Reaper is straight up the most stable piece of audio software I have ever used. It has only ever crashed on me once, which I'll get to in a moment. I never see weird, inscrutable messages or have functions not work as advertised. 
Their quality control process must be very well dialed in, and they have small updates constantly, adding small features and fixing problems as they come up. Reaper checks for updates on startup, and I must receive a notice that an update is available at least once a week. And since there is no copy protection or registration portal to slow you down, you go straight to the Reaper website, download the latest version for your platform, install it over the previous version, and off you go. Eight years ago, I had a team of musicians building out a series of rock band style songs for a browser-based game. We had a short time to do a ton of work and could not afford any slip-ups. We were using Reaper to do the note tracking or laying out of the MIDI data that generated the notes that you see on the screen as the song moves down the track. Everything was moving along fine, but then Reaper started crashing on us during the note tracking process. I soon realized that the crashing was replicable and started trying to figure out what was going wrong. It had turned out that in some songs, there was a short gap before the music actually started and we were using strange time signatures such as 1-7 for one bar at the very beginning of the music to cover that gap. These weird time signatures were causing the note tracking plugin to crash. So once I figured it out, I sent Reaper a bug report out of the blue with the steps to cause the crash, as well as a sample Reaper session for them to look at. This was at 4 p.m. The next morning, we started working again. I was nervous about how we were going to get around the crash bug, but we didn't need to. The Reaper engineers had fixed the problem overnight and sent an email to me with the updated plugin. Now, when was the last time you sent a bug report to any large software company and had them fix the problem that quickly? There are three areas in which Reaper absolutely blows the doors off of any competing DAWs I have used. Media items, tracks, and rendering. Every single region or snippet of audio in Reaper is considered a media item, and each media item has a variety of individual parameters that can be set from its information window. Playback speed and pitch, number of channels it outputs as, whether to play in reverse, and a number of others. But the best part is that you can assign individual chains of effects to every single media item. So if I'm working on dialogue and a character moves from an exterior to an interior and then walks through a series of rooms, I can easily assign different reverb effects to each room. And then if another character is speaking along with them, it is trivial to copy the effects from one media item to another. In every other DAW I have ever used, you specify a track to have a certain channel size. It can take mono files or stereo files, but never both on the same track. Similarly, you can't mix sampling rates or file types on the same track in many DAWs. Not Reaper. It doesn't care what kind of files you throw on the same track. Mono, stereo, 7.1, 44 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, it's all good. You can even throw a JPEG onto the same Reaper track with audio content. It'll simply display it in the video window. Finally, the audio rendering function is unbelievably flexible. It works great for bouncing out final mixes as well as stems in any format, sample rate, and channel size that you might want. But it also has a sophisticated region output function, which is perfect for interactive audio and video games, where you would want a large number of shorter files. The file naming convention is as full-featured as you would expect at this point, allowing you to create arbitrarily complex file names based on any track, project, or media item parameters you could possibly want. This is an absolute godsend when creating Reaper projects that have, say, a hundred separate sound effect or dialogue files that you need to output. Reaper's capabilities have been expanded even further through having a well-documented, open architecture and thriving user community. There are an amazing number of free, user-combined themes that completely change the look and feel of Reaper out there for you to choose from. Even better are the third-party extensions that extend the functionality of Reaper in any way you could think of, and many ways you can't. Of particular import is a large suite of functions called the SWS extensions. This easily doubles the number of available actions you can access. It is so useful that it should just automatically be included with a Reaper installer. And once again, the cost? Nothing. Totally free. The reason for this plethora of free add-ons is Reaper's scripting capabilities. You can access any function or element within Reaper by using Rescript, which is their built-in scripting language. 
The API is well documented and you can program it in Eel, which is their built-in default language, but you can also write in Lua or Python. It comes with an integrated development environment or IDE with a debugger. There is also a console that allows you to quickly type in rescript commands on the fly without executing a script. Not to put too fine a point on it, but let me repeat that last part. This is a digital audio workstation that includes scripting capabilities in three different scripting languages, a script editor and a debugger. What? 90% of Reaper users out there will never need the ability to write a script to extend Reaper. But for those of us who do, it is an absolute marvel, unparalleled in any other DAW that I'm aware of. For sound designers, the combination of Pro Tools and SoundMiner are a de facto standard. SoundMiner is librarian software that allows you to create databases of sounds, search for the ones you want in a variety of ways, and then create bins of those files, or spot them directly into the Pro Tools timeline. Creating a database in SoundMiner is trivially easy. All you do is drag and drop files onto the SoundMiner window. You can add metadata to each file, and then write that metadata back to the files themselves. So if you need to create another SoundMiner database with that file in the future, the metadata will already be there. SoundMiner is powerful, but it has its own specific user interface and learning curve. Reaper has a window called the Media Explorer that does the basic, most fundamental functions of SoundMiner. You can create databases from directories of files, then rapidly search their file name and description fields with keywords. You can quickly audition through the files that match the search, and when you find the one you want, you can drag it directly into the Reaper timeline where you want it. You can also select smaller segments of a file to drag in, and can even verispeed it, just like you can in SoundMiner. Media Explorer is nowhere near as feature-rich or powerful as SoundMiner, but what it lacks in features, it makes up in being integrated into Reaper itself. And the price is certainly right. It lets me do the most important sound library search functions I need, quickly and easily. For that reason, Media Explorer has become my go-to sound librarian. So after using Pro Tools for post-production, dialogue recording, and music production for 20 years, I have switched over to Reaper and have not looked back. The reasons all revolve around convenience. Reaper is quick, stable, and compact, runs on very modest computers, and is completely configurable. The audio editing is lightning quick, and the ability to apply effects and playback parameters to individual regions is incredibly useful. And being able to have audio files of different types, sampling rates, and number of channels on the same track is worth its weight in gold. The price is incredibly reasonable, the software is constantly updated, and there is a huge user library of add-ons and themes to make it even more your own. There is no copy protection, you can install it on as many computers as you use, and the Media Explorer's database and searching functions makes post-production in Reaper a practical reality. There is never a day that goes by using Reaper that I have not learned something new I can do to speed up my workflow, enhance my sound design capabilities, and create higher quality audio more quickly and more cheaply. My thanks to Kakos for creating such a superb product and making it available for the audio industry at large, at a price that works for fledgling hobbyists or stone-cold professionals. So that's it for this episode of Under the Big Tree. As always, if you like, join the conversation by sharing your thoughts and experiences on this topic in the comments section below. If you like what we're doing here on Under the Big Tree, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. For now, this is Nick, signing off.